My name is Neil Burridge. Welcome to my sword corner. Over the last 20 years I've made a lot of these. I've seen a lot of swords in museums and I've learned a lot and I'd like to share it with you. back for another video. Today we're going to look at um, Carp's Tongue Sword and we're going to use the Borton Malaby hordes which I saw recently um, to kind of fill it in to make um, sort of more sense of what we're looking at. So this sword is called a Carp's Tongue Sword. They're a pretty unusual shape. Um, they're unusual because they're not leaf bladed. You've got the long parallel edges that slightly widen here. Then you've got this sort of quite pronounced taper at the end of the blade. And I think that's where the carp's tongue idea comes from. The handles are very straight with a big flare out. I've made this one. Well, I did the mould for this one ages ago. Um, it's one of the first swords I saw in the Museum of London. Um, the curator, John Cotton, um, was there. And he, he was very open and very uh, keen for me to see stuff. So it was one of the first swords that come out of the museum, um, out of the display cases. And I got a chance to sit and look at it and feel the weight of it. And I carved the mould. And... I actually got the balance point of the casting within sort of 10 millimeters of the original and I got the weight right as well so in a way it's quite an achievement so it's one of my oldest molds that I still use today because I've got it pretty close so we're going to look under the um, close-up camera there and, and talk through the details of the carp's tongue sword this is the only fully complete carp's tongue sword in this country. Most of them turn up in broken hordes and that's why the Malaby hoard was such an interesting thing to see and why it will fill out the story of um, this sword. I've always said that this sword was designed by Citroen because really it's a French sword and when you look at the carp's tongue hordes they're spread all the way across France and then cross the channel and come to Ken, in, usually in scrap hordes. So there's trade going on. Um, we'll have a closer look at this under the uh, camera and see some interesting points about it. Get my magic stick. So I've used, on this, I've used the pommel form of a uh, sword from Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember where from Anastasia. There's a a bronze handled sword with this wide lozenge shaped pommel, and I've used it because it just fills it in. Because if I just you fill finish the sword to there, it kind of lacks something. It's not really interesting. They have big rivets down the middle of the handles, and they're very hard to do. Um, some of them are even bigger than this. They go out to about 9, 10 mil. I mean, to get such a big rivet in such a narrow handle, you, you kind of wonder why. There's obviously it means something. And then this one has the four rivets here. The blade, if, if you can see this, as nearly all carp's tongue swords have this parallel line forged into the blade. Just one line and it goes all the way down and tapers. They all have the edges forged. When I was lucky enough to see the Borton Malaby Horde, it had about four or five really interesting um, handles off swords. Two of them are exquisite. And they had punch decoration on the handles to illuminate them. And the same with some punch rows of punch dots in a, a pattern across the blade there, just to, to make the sword interesting. It had quite thick flanges on the swords. Same again then, coming down to a, a tang or a tail or whatever you call these. 
Um, but quite interesting, but very square. You, you get a feeling there's a sort of squareness about the size, very upright. Um, let me turn it around the other way. So we're looking at the points now. So this is why they get given this name, because of the the type, this carp stung sword thing. So it's obviously a unique form of um, fighting logically. It's very unusual that nearly all the blades in Britain especially are, are going towards leaf shaped forms. And this kind of steps out of that. The Gunlingen swords, which are around this time and a bit later, um, again use this narrow blade form, but they haven't got this pronounced. They're more leaf shape form. They're almost like a end development of the um, sword. So I think the date wise, we're looking pretty well on in the late Bronze Age. So I think it's um, 850, oh, but I think 950 down to 800 BC with these types of hordes. Um, you can see the lines carry up and they just meet somewhere on the blade. I haven't got my glass on so I can't see it. Um, so they just cross over, but that tends to be 99% of the decoration. So that's what interesting about seeing the swords in the Borton Malaby hoard and all the extra stuff with it. So again, all bronze swords forged there. They also have these quite marked cutouts on these and you kind of see it similar with um, Wilburton swords as well um, as another feature they share but not the linear handle forms and again the decoration comes up and it curves and this is obviously done with a jig but this is done by hands because if you look at the book with all the drawings of carpstung swords in the lines vary they they can go left or right um, and not always in the same place so we're going to look at some of the other things in the Malaby hoard. I was lucky. I got invited to see this hoard um, as, as a working thing. I had to recreate several parts of the hoard. And um, I got to work with a lovely uh, conservator, Dana Goodburn. And she showed me some really interesting things close up that they'd found working on the hoard, cleaning and restoring it. And it, it, it was quite interesting to see that bit of the science you don't often see. The, the fact she was there looking through, finding things, showed me all these funny hammer marks and crystal patterns in the bronze. And that uh, was a really enlightening time. So I was also able to get some uh, resin models made uh, on the days I was there. And then we could take the resin models and start making copies of them. And... The hoard is, hordes are fascinating. Hordes are the most exciting thing because you get a, we're back again. <laughs> we had to wait for a tractor to drive past. Um, so the hoard was really interesting. It opened so many windows. The Borta Malaby hoard is um, 355 objects, I think. Um, they found a couple of objects hidden inside objects like socket axes and things. So. That was quite interesting. But there's a whole array of stuff and a lot of the stuff in the hoard had been broken up to the size that it could be melted down. So I, th I think it's what they might call a founder's hoard. Had a l swords, a lot of broken spears, knives, all kinds of, and some really unusual stuff, which is um, the bit I find most exciting. The things that don't make sense. Never seen them before. Best thing that I saw there, apart from the swords, was the ads. These beautiful winged ads. Never seen them before. And apparently, I think it's the first time they've ever been found in this country. And uh, they follow on from what are called the uh, winged power staves, which have these power staves um, where the hafting is 
encompassed in the wings are folded over the word. I'll show you in a minute. If you could pass that axe to me. Thank you. So oh, I've got to put my props out. So you can, you can see an, an axe here with the wings folded over. These are quite common in southwest of England, southeast of England, Kent, and they do travel across this country. They get less and less. The further away you get from Kent, the rarer they become. So this one's actually uh, from St. Earth in Cornwall near Hale. So it's 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 got to be an import. I don't think these are um, sort of naturally um, made in Cornwall. So it's quite interesting. The St. Earth Horde, which is one we'll look at that later, was um, a Ewart Park sword and an axe and gold work. And it's not far from here. It's quite beautiful. So... The winged power stave things is quite wonderful and quite hard to reproduce. I think I've cast about seven now and they're still very hard to cast. Um, but quite unique. So they, they would have gone on the handle like this and then be used as a carpentry tool and adds to uh, work out. Another interesting thing in the hoard, we'll look at these under the um, thing in a minute, was... This, there was half a socket hammer. The hammer had broken or been broken for the hoard to remelt down. And um, it had some really interesting. One was the distortion, which you managed to um, preserve with a um, um, resin cast of it. And we managed to make it. Well, I haven't got it here. It's the same as this one, though. This is the one corrected with a kind of new end. But the other one had quite a bias on one side where it had been repeatedly hit and it had distorted the hammer. And it also had the casting lines along diagonal corners rather than like this one, the casting line was on the side. It had been cast at sort of 45 degrees and the casting lines were there. And we managed to recreate that. We took the resin model and rebuilt the handle but it is, it's nice to see because it creates a whole picture of what's there in the, in the hoard. Um, lots of these. I can't remember exactly. It's probably about seven or eight of these broken. A lot of them were broken in halves and that. So again, remember to break something like this, you've got to heat it up till it's bright orange and then it'll break easily. Um, lots and lots of spears um i was looking at some write-ups on other hordes and they start splitting spears and javelins into two different categories but i think the write-up for this horde it described them as uh, edged weapons which i thought was a much better description so so i've got these we're going to have a look at those and Lots and lots. We'll wait for the tractor to go past. Yeah, so I'm on a farm and life goes on here. People are working and doing stuff. So lots of socket axes. They're quite a big um, sort of portion of many, many hordes. You do get hordes of lots and lots of axes and no weapons. So, which is quite interesting, but not this one. So this is quite good. So it gives us a, I can't believe this, just because I'm filming the traffic's uh, picking up outside. Um, so you get lots and lots of socket axes in this hoard as well. But the most interesting thing, apart from things having a clue what they were and haven't made, is these beautiful things. They're called hogsback knives. Unfortunately, in the hoard, there's about two or three of them. And this was the most complete one. And it, it's just the most charming. The original one had about this much missing, chopped off the end. But we rebuilt it, the model, and uh, I've cast from this. And, and it's quite interesting that possibly the hammer used to hammer it was why there was the distortion because the guy was trying to squish the edge on an anvil 
with the tools. I don't know if that's come out in focus. But anyway, we're going to have a look at it under the thing. And the last thing in the hoard was the bugle-shaped objects. So they all belong to this what are called Carp's Tongue Ewart Park complex. Um, so we're not going to do Ewart Park saws today. But these were the middle bit of this is a sword fitting that goes on a belt or belt suspension but nobody's found one located in the ground next to a sword with all the paraphernalia attaching it to the sword so we'll have a quick look under there so we clear these out so we'll look at this quickly um this is the ads with the you can see where I've been hammering the the wings over to get the tunneling effect so the haft on both sides would go in and locate like that. I said we'll do it that way around, that's better. Yeah, I've got one side tighter than the other. They may have fitted the half and then finally hammered the wings over. It's got a loop to help secure it so it must have been hafted that way so it doesn't you can see it bites from quite a shallow angle it's not actually sharp I've, that's where i've just left it off i haven't sharpened it so it, even just as uh finished hammering it's working quite well the other one uh, from the hoard is really interesting is a hog's back knife what they use for I don't know but what's so nice about this is it you could hang it from your neck on a cord you could use it it's not been sharpened um, you could use it for a whole manner of practical things either scraping furs sharpening stuff or even just as a carpentry tool nobody has any idea um, I've made several and I'm hoping to hear back from a, a hide tanner who's got one of these to see how he gets on with it because he's been using um, brass sheet with a wooden handle to scrape hides so I'm hoping he'll come back to me and say what's good about this and what's bad so with all things this is hammered down theoretically you could get it to a razor edge it's almost got the proportions side on that you could turn it into a razor and shave so but i have no idea there was numerous spears in the hoard all different sorts and it was in i think i might be wrong it was either in the back of one of the sockets that somebody had pushed in something and it had got stuck in there and you couldn't until all the dirt was cleaned off in conservation they couldn't really see so we're looking at ch cross channel connections very strong connections um, at this time with france the carp's tongue swords they're quite a common type in the mediterranean generally but they vary a lot but this hoard and the border malibu hoard has connections that go across france the sword types um, the tools, the hog's back knives and the ads, they're all part of this um, kind of collection that's um, basically France, England or Kent and France have very strong trade connections. So we're going to um, sort of wind up looking at um, the sword once more. Quite, th I mean, this is probably nearly as large as they get and I have a feeling the ones in the bottom Malaby hoard might have been even longer than this because they're all broken up and there's only a tiny fractions of them you can't gauge the size but one of the things that did strike me was the blaze sections across are very big much bigger than this which gives an idea that the swords were stronger um, and longer than this one um, there is um, an earlier sword that's um, 
very similar to Wilberton's sword. And there is a, um, there's a broken one in a hoard in um, Cambridgeshire called the uh, Islam Hoard. And in the, the sword there is complete. It's a complete sword broken into two and a half inch lengths. And it's a um, French sword. And I think it's called the saint Nazaire type sword. So it's like a very long Wilberton sword with the lines. So it shows that stuff is travelling across Britain two and a half, three thousand years ago. There's strong connections, materials are travelling and ideas are travelling. But it's just strange these swords end up in hordes. Mostly they're not actually in circulation as weapons. It's also interesting that the metalwork seems to stick to a fairly um, uniform alloy. In the hoard, it's got several uh, big copper ingots, which is quite interesting because if you were trading scrap, you'd be looking to melt down your bronze and make it all into ingots and, and trade that. But they're trading broken stuff. So maybe it was somebody hoarding stuff over time, but they're... The collection's all from one short space in history, so everything kind of fits into a tight band. Um, but the alloy used is, uh, I think I think they quite often call it um, carp's tongue metal or Europe Park carp's tongue complex metal. So it has a uniformity about it. So there you go. So I thought it'd be an interesting uh, look at this. Um, and I find it quite interesting. It just shows that France and Britain, even way before the sword, had a lot of connections. Especially when you go back to Neolithic, there's lots of trade connections. So we've always been woven into that framework of exchange with people in Europe. Anyway, thank you. I hope that kind of worked for you. I don't monetize my films. Um, the idea is to share my knowledge with you. So if you um, want to support me, you can buy me a cup of coffee in the link below. And if you could like, share and hit the subscribe button, that'd be fantastic. Thank you.